Hey everybody, I am Art Prof TA Deep D. Manon, and I am joined here by Art Prof TA Alex Rowe and Professor Liu. How is everyone doing? Today our stream is on why is my art not selling? If you are looking to strengthen and flex your art muscle, pow, we are the community for you. We have tutorials, critiques, and more, and they are all for free. So on the topic of why my art is not selling, I feel like this is a question that every single person who has tried to sell their art has had without fail. And Clara, why do you think that this is? I think it's really challenging. I think when you sell your art, there's a million factors. Where are you showing it? How you're promoting it? What are your prices? Who's your audience? And it's so easy to make a mistake in any of those places and really be frustrated. So we're gonna go through some of those points today for some of those factors to be considering. So the first one is finding your audience. A lot of people don't realize how important it is to find the right people to buy your art. Alex, what do we mean by this? I think for me, when I think of who wants to buy my two-dimensional visual art, it's the people that are attracted to the nuanced subject matter. Like the piece in the background in this photo was the second in what turned out to be an airplane series I did. Because I did one piece featuring an airplane just for fun, no reason. And at a show I had, it was purchased by people who were pilots, like amateur pilots. And then their friends talked to their friends and yada, yada, yada. I get to the point of doing airplane paintings for people. And so that's, I think, what it means in finding your audience. You don't look for artist communities necessarily. You don't look for people that you necessarily personally connect with, just people that are connected to an element in your work. For sure. And I think oftentimes you don't realize the strange little niche communities who will get really into your artwork. Like, Deepti, you said school teachers love your stuff. How did you figure that out? Yeah, it's interesting because I just sold my stuff for fun on Instagram. I never really was a serious art seller. I would just make things and have so much of them that I'd be like, I might as well make a couple bucks out of this. And then I started realizing because of the quirky nature and the color palettes that I use and the emotions that a lot of my pieces have, school teachers really liked the magnets that I made because they'd have the kids, you know, put unhappy faces sometimes when they're like feeling sad or I once had a science teacher make a custom order of different body parts with faces on them. So it really was like a discovery I made while creating the work. And then also a lot of um, moms of friends of mine really liked my work. So I think sometimes it makes sense. Like, you know, Alex, what you said, you know, it makes a lot of sense that pilots would want airplane imagery, but Sometimes it's not like intuitive and you have to like put your work out there to realize that and then community finds you. Mm -hmm. Blue Will Spirit has a really good point and this is a very common mistake is that artists, we make the art, but I'll tell you guys, I almost never buy art because all my friends are artists. And so most <laughs> of the time I'm doing art trades or people are giving to them to me as gifts and everything. And so actually there's a lot of online marketplaces where honestly it's just artists trying to sell to other artists who hang out there and so oftentimes you have to go where artists do not hang out like mm -hmm. for example lauren welch who's a teaching artist here she does all these beautiful marker drawings of birds and so i would say if you draw birds go meet the birding community. Talk to the people at the Audubon Society. Like those are your people, people who really are gonna appreciate the type of work that you're making. Because this is a great comment from H who says, from a consumerist view, it depends heavily on your market, type of people you're selling to. Some may like sophisticated realistic paintings while others might like simplified and cute trinkets. Yeah, like Deepti, your audience probably is not going to be into Alex's paintings of planes, right? Like you have to think about who are you trying to target? Like I did these watercolor paintings of landscapes in Utah. Alex, who should I market this to? Oh, without a doubt, I would look at hikers. I would look at people who love the outdoors. Like I look at those and my grandma was an avid hiker and she would love those like hanging in her kitchen, you know? You have to kind of think creatively about 
wh whose wall do you see your art on? And it, it, you have to be able to think outside of the box on that. Like, to be honest, mm -hmm. I didn't expect pilots to like my work <laughs> until they started liking it. Exactly. And sometimes when it's a place, especially people have a certain connection. Like this is the strange place in Utah. It's called Goblin Valley. I mean, it literally looks like an alien planet. And mm. so I find sometimes like the art doesn't even have to be that good. Like the fact that it's a painting of Goblin Valley will make people want to get the piece just for that very reason alone. Now, another reason why you might be struggling to sell your work maybe you haven't done the research. So Deepti, what do we mean by the research? Well, there's a lot of research that goes into it. There's certain, you know, platforms that might work better for your, like, are you using social media? Have you looked into communities that might be interested in your artwork? But also I recommend doing the research of other people who are making work similar to yours and how they're marketing themselves. Like, Alex, I don't know what your you know, preferred way of selling is, but have you found that when you're at, you know, tabling at a show, you kind of steal ideas from other artists and like how they're marketing themselves and use that in the future? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the gallery show I was in in Denver, it was a two person show. So me and another artist named Deborah split the show and we did have a very honest talk with each other about pricing our work similarly. You know, because in that case, especially with two people, you don't want the whole left side of the room to be thousands of dollars and the whole right side of the room to be hundreds of dollars. You do want to have a kind of sense of that. And also, especially in, as you said, the illustration based work that I do, there is a kind of limit on how much money people will want to spend on illustration, no matter how good it is, no matter how much time was put into it, it is still considered like a low brow art. And deep, deep tabling is something that I think is always a good experience because you really start to see how do people make their decisions about what to buy? What are they attracted to? Like one of my former students is a comic artist and he told me that all his comics were black and white and he tabled next to his friend who had all color comics. And they said to me afterwards, wow, I realized how important color is in terms of selling because your average person usually is not as attracted to black and white comics. So DT, when you've tabled, what have you noticed about how people buy and sell art? I've noticed a lot of times being hyper specific is really useful. Like I've tabled before at events that are specific to some sort of charity or movement like a reproductive justice uh, event. And I, after these, I realized that a lot of times artists will make work around the event that they're tabling at because so many people like the audience members who are coming there are there to support this cause. So they, you know, love to leave there with work that also shows that they've supported this cause physically. Um, so I've learned that. And I've also learned that pricing your work is really important, being aware of who you're tabling with. And one thing I do like about tabling is it gets, it gives you an opportunity to show your personality as the artist and meet people and make relationships that way too. A lot of times on Instagram, people will see your work and be like, oh, that's nice, but they don't get to meet you and hear about your process and make a personal connection with you. And sometimes you can cut them a deal. So it is a really good idea, I think sometimes to table and then just like, give your card out and gain a following in a way. Sometimes you might not sell a lot, but you do leave there with other pros. Neil is asking, how do I know if I'm ready to sell art? That is a great question. I know a lot of people are very unsure about, oh, is it good enough? Do I know what to do? Alex, how do you know? Okay, I'm ready to go. Or maybe you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think more often than not, you don't know and you just have to sort of take the plunge. Uh, there is a certain degree of fake it till you make it, but I, I've i never liked that phrase in this sense because I do think the artist does know if you genuinely in your heart of hearts think like, ah, it's not quite good enough yet. If you recognize that as not anxiety, but as, okay, I need to work on these things and really make it good, then you're ready. For me, the moment came when I noticed more and more people were asking me if I sold prints or the artwork. That was kind of the tell of I wouldn't actively sell it. But when enough people asked, oh, is this for sale? Like, oh, do you have prints? Like then I would kind of read the room a little bit and start selling. 
Deep D, did you have that, that people were just inquiring or did you decide to start selling from the get-go? Yeah, I, I noticed that it was through inquiry and so much of my art is wearable art, like pins, um, hats, tote bags, uh, temporary tattoos. So I was just kind of a walking uh, advertisement for a lot of my work without realizing and people would be like, oh, do you, do you sell those? And I'm like a very, I, I love to just give my art away. So for birthdays, I would give my art or make things for people. And my whole house has incense burners that I've made out of clay. And so people would just come over and ask and I would just give them away. And then I started realizing like, why am I just giving these away? Like people are willing to give me money. So then I just started posting them on Instagram and being like five bucks, 10 bucks. And then I started realizing that I could, you know, sell for more. So it was totally a learning process. But I do think that if you're making work and people are like, oh, that's cool, but they don't really say anything else. Maybe there's not like a market for it for purchasing. But if people are really interested in like, I want that, tack a number on it and see if they want to give you some money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say there's no moment where you say, I'm ready. It, it's like you just sort of read the room a little bit and there's no reason you have to go full out and open a gigantic shop. I mean, you can just sell couple items, just ease into it. It does not have to be anything that's that big or involved. I just want to give a shout out to you, Rye World, who's saying, I'm so grateful to you guys. You have no idea. I've been self-taught for a long time and you're helping me to improve. Thanks again. Well, thank you so much for watching. I'm so happy we can help you that way. Another reason why I think people struggle to sell their work, it really has a lot to do with the photographs. Alex, why are the photos you shoot so critical in selling your work? Uh, because unless you're selling it in person, like at a gallery or a stand or a market, the photo is the only way that people can see the work. So if you have a bad photo quality, people don't know if it's a bad photo or if it's a bad piece of art. And if they're buying it from an online resource and the photo is bad, we're just going to glaze right over it. Yeah, I mean, people don't realize that the photo, it literally makes or breaks your impression of the artwork. And I'll tell you, I know people who I follow on Instagram, not just because I like their work, but because I love their photos. <laughs> like I just like seeing their presentation and the lighting and everything. I mean, Deep D, do you spend a lot of time setting up your photos and making sure things are lit well? Do you do that? Yeah, and you know, something I learned from spending a lot of time on Etsy, because I like to buy Etsy jewelry, is that for wearable art, which a lot of my work is, it's sometimes better to actually show the art in use. Like for earrings, I've noticed that on Etsy, I'll buy earrings when they're photographed on a person's ear or a necklace that's being worn because I want to see how it fits on a body. And I never thought of that for a pin to post a photo of it on a denim jacket rather than just, you know, on a plain piece of paper or in the packaging. So a lot of it does have to do to, to like appeal to people. But I, yeah, I agree. Fo really good photographs, making sure it's lit well. And, you know, in this example on the screen right now, you don't want to see any extra background for no reason, you know, unless it's there to add to the texture or the image. So doing a lot of experimentation and I think looking at, you know, marketplaces where someone's work is selling that's similar to yours, but it's selling really well. How are they photographing? How are they presenting? How are they marketing? It's it's all it's all a really tricky game. Um, and sometimes your work might be awesome, but you're just not presenting it in the right way. Yeah, and I find sometimes that if people don't take the time to shoot the photographs, that's the deal breaker. It's like people will just walk away in two seconds and you can get creative about how you photograph your artwork. Like I have this former student who's a ceramicist and she'll just take like this one branch of a lilac flower and put it in her vase and it's like gorgeous, right? It's like she didn't have to do that, but it's like, that's a nice little touch that just makes the photographing a lot better. Now, the thing about photographing your work, it's not a small task. So Alex, can you talk about, obviously we have this tutorial you guys can watch, but just in general, why it's not something you can just rush and do in two seconds. Yeah, the aha moment for me about it was that photography in and of itself is, of course, a whole other frame of art. So you cannot just simply spend hours on a painting or a sculpture 
and say, eh, that, that's a good enough picture. No, you have to plan through it. It is a way capturing your medium with another medium. We have a question from Seven Angelic. They are saying, what do you think about places like Redbubble and such for selling merch of your stuff? We're actually going to get to that, but I would say in a nutshell, I think it's amazing <laughs> that these sites exist because when I was in the olden days, you had to buy all the t-shirts and then sell them. And the fact that you can just stuff on demand, I think just blows my mind. Deep D, what do you think? I agree. And also it's a whole new audience that just wouldn't, like if, if you're selling on Instagram, these people might not naturally come to your Instagram, but sites like Etsy or Redbubble or a website, people can just type in, you know, um, t-shirt with art prof or, or artistic, t I don't know, something. And hopefully you're using your tags well and using your marketing that the website provides you. And you're suddenly opened up to all of these new people who would probably never find your work otherwise. So other than it being on demand and you really don't have to spend a lot initially, you get a whole new audience, which is awesome. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of my sales on my Etsy shop, they're from people who found me on Etsy. I mean, your average person on the planet is not typing in Clara Lou, what is she selling? Most people <laughs> are typing in creepy, haunting, crayon portrait of a screaming face, they get to me. And that's how it works. So I think you have to realize that you have to spread yourself out because Alex, I think for you, you probably have a following on Instagram and those people know you, but you don't always want to like limit yourself to that. You want to put yourself out there. Alex, how are some other ways you've put yourself out there other than just Instagram? Yeah. Uh, well, before I answer that, I just want to give a shout out and a thanks to Raw Nuck for the donation for us. Uh, thank you so much for that support. Um, uh, yeah, I think beyond Instagram, uh, word of mouth and also like from my work in coffee shops, there's actually a very big market in coffee shops, restaurants, cafes and breweries for hanging and displaying art. And it's the kind of thing that I honestly kind of like turned my nose up at when I was like just out of school. I was like, oh, I'm too good for that. And then it's like, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> like, that's a great way to showcase your art. And that is the thing of more on the research. You want to be sure that your work matches the vibe of the place you're trying to sell it at. There's, yeah, I love talking about one of my favorite breweries in Denver was heavy metal themed. And the shows they show there are super cool. And the art is naturally fits in with the theme. It's very dark, it's moody, it's very goth. Um, and that thing would not fit in with your neighborhood like cafe over by the gap, you know? So you just have to be aware of who you're showing it to. Yeah, and Deep Deep, in your experience, why does the venue matter so much? Because I think a lot of people make the assumption, ooh, this looks really great, it's high visibility, but sometimes it's not a good fit. Why do you think that is? Well, I think you have to ask yourself, like, are people spending time in that space? A cafe is probably a great place to sell your art because a lot of times, well, I guess pre-pandemic, a lot of times people go to cafes and spend hours there to work and will just stare at the walls and really spend time with your work. So that might be a wonderful place to sell your work. But I don't know, Clara, have you ever tabled somewhere where you thought it was going to be really great or shown your work somewhere because of, I don't know, maybe it had high traffic or high visibility, but it ended up being totally the opposite? Oh yeah, this was a long time ago, but there was this summer marketplace they had for artists in Boston and it was at Boston City Hall, which is a huge public plaza, tons and tons of people going in and out of that space. And I thought, oh man, this is gonna be great, Boston City Hall. And I tabled there and people did not buy stuff. And I was like, this is so weird. And then it occurred to me that the place, the physical place they put us at the plaza was like a transition place. It was where people walked by, like people were trying to get somewhere. It wasn't a place like a cafe where people are lounging around and taking their time. And so ultimately that sounded really good, but it was not, it was not effective at all. Whereas Alex, I know you have sometimes done these flash sales on Instagram and those are really effective. Why do you think that is? I think, when I think about why they're effective, I think it might be because they're so casual. Like when I first did them, it was honestly because I was moving and I wanted to clear out space in my studio. 
So I was getting rid of works that I just hadn't sold or hadn't tried to sell. And I posted them on an Instagram story and just said, hey, anyone, like, name your price. We'll talk about it. And I said, if more than one person wants it, we'll do a very casual, like, auction thing where I'll say, Bob wants to spend, spend this much. Steve, can you match that? And it went so well that I've done more and more of them. Of course, I have to make the work first. <laughs> but I found that I have just a big enough following to do that on Instagram. And it's a good way to kind of barter with people about how it helped me identify how much I should price my work for, to be honest, because I was getting rid of pieces that were collecting dust on my end. So I could ask friends and family, how much would you honestly pay for that? Deepti, have you ever done sales on Instagram? I never have. So I'm actually really curious. I have. I, I think that's where I make the most money. And I think it's just because, again, it was all my work. I don't, you know, make work, Alex, like you do in gouache that takes hours. A lot of my clay stuff, I make a ton, of, you know, at once and it's just meditative. And then I like to sell them. So Instagram seemed like the natural place to do it because it felt very low risk and to my friends. And it works so well because it is kind of, you know, like oh, I have all this stuff, I'm trying to get rid of it. And then people would start be like, I really like that, but could you make it like this and start offering me an amount? And that was a really good way to work too. And what I found is because I am an artist, I did find that selling on Instagram opened it up to my artistic community and people were actually, my artist friends were buying it, but they would give me prices that made more sense sometimes than people outside of the artistic community. So it helped me realize what I actually should. Cause you know, outside of the artistic community, sometimes you'll get like $3 for something that should be 50. <laughs> um, but an artist sometimes might be more empathetic to how long it takes to make something and they price it a little bit more correctly. <laughs> I want to emphasize what Alex said earlier about not turning your nose up at any venue, because this is work by Lauren Welch. It's in a white cube gallery, really formal, looks amazing sometimes you'll sell more on Instagram than you will in a brick and mortar gallery. So just because it's in a gallery doesn't mean it's gonna do better. In fact, sometimes it's the opposite and you can do really well when you table. I mean, I haven't done it in years and years, but when I used to do open studios, I'd pull in like 2000 within two days. So you can really do well. It's all a matter, I think, about marketing. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Iolin Murphy says print on demand takes such a big percentage, but not having to pay those upfront costs is worth it. Yeah, you do have to think about those percentages because if you sell on Etsy, they do take a cut. If you do payment through PayPal, they take a cut. But you know what? I don't mind paying those fees because what you get in return is huge. Alex, what do you think about all those little fees that you get charged? Yeah, I'm still very slow on actually setting up like a Redouble or Society6 um, for myself. But that seems totally fair to push all of that printing. And as you said with the t-shirts, it used to be you had to pay for and print all of the t-shirts you wanted to sell up front. So you'd have to have a lot of cash at the beginning to even start selling. But with sites like that, the percentage they take is totally fair to give more artists the freedom to start selling their work as merch. I mean, Deepti, do those fees bother you? Do you try to avoid it or how do you deal with that? I It doesn't bother me if I'm getting more traffic. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm coming out with more money because I already sell my work for not a lot. You know, it, the fees also aren't too much. They're sometimes just a dollar because it, it's a percentage of what I'm selling. So I think you have to, you know, think logically and figure out is it are you getting a lot more traffic using these sites? Because then it might be worth it. If you're not and you're selling the same amount as you were on Instagram, maybe reapproach your marketing and figure out a way to make those sites work for you. Because I do think they really do work, but you have to put in a little bit of effort. AJ is asking, is Instagram better than others? Because I've seen many people get choosing beggars with artists and it seems annoying. Alex, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Yeah, I... Choosing beggars, I find them more funny than anything else. And just really quickly kind of like cancel that out. Um, I have not found that problem on Instagram. I think because I've canceled that out quickly, I just don't entertain it. Um, yeah, I find Instagram to be a really good one because you can connect with your buyer as a person as well. And it helps you kind of recognize that and then recognize it as well. 
So I like that human interaction that it helps to provide. What do you think, Deepa? Okay, stupid question. What is choosing beggars? <laughs> I don't oh. know what it is. I, I don't know what that is either. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole like subgroups on the internet that uh, show photos of what a choosing beggar would be. So an example would be someone is selling a table on Craigslist. And like, table, slightly worn, the lowest I can go is $100. And then someone will message, I'll pay you $20 please, my dog is sick. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just people trying to get the lowest price they can for no reason. I mean, my feeling based on your description, Alex, is Instagram probably comes across to more people as a little bit more professional than that because Instagram really, I think, is the primary social media platform that professional artists are using today. So yeah, I mean, every platform has a different type of reputation or look. Um, Deep D, what do you think about this question? Where exactly do you table? Because there are so many opportunities, like how you know where to table. Mm. I think you want to really look into what, what kind of people have tabled at that event in the past. You know, like a lot of times I'll, in the artistic community on Facebook pages, someone will be like, for example, I tabled at a um, event for reproductive justice and we donated, I think, 20% of all of our proceeds to Planned Parenthood. And a lot of the people who tabled in the previous one were women were selling, you know, things under a hundred dollars. There was like a very specific um, niche for who was selling and then, you know, result, a result of that, who was coming in. And so I felt like I fit well there, but I don't know if I was selling somewhere where it was a lot of work like Alex's or like Lauren's, if my work would do so well, but also maybe it would because it would be very different. Who knows? Um, so you really just have to do your research. But I think doing events in places, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but doing events in places that have a lot of traffic, um, but traffic that stays, you know, not a train station, like, but maybe the part of a train station where people are waiting. Um, so you just have to really do your research. But Alice, how do you go about finding where to table? I think that in the illustration market, it's thankfully pretty cut and dry where the peak for a lot of folks is uh, comic cons and comic conventions, which happen in every city, um, in every state. And from my experience of friends going and purchasing prints, they're really a great resource for artists to make a lot of money. However, the tables are usually expensive. So that's the one in that ethereal question of how do I know if I'm ready? That's a very cut and dry one where it's like, oh, you got to make sure that your work is good enough and that you have enough quality prints and that you're ready enough to sell to be able to afford the cost of this table. Um, yeah, things like, say, farmer's markets, things like that, even those will have booth costs. So when you can, it's a good idea to split those with other artists, split those costs. Uh, but yeah, you have to, when you look at the really good table spots, they do cost money to rent. And a lot of money. We're not talking $50. We're no. talking in some cases for those big conventions, it could be $1,000. Sometimes it's 500. I mean, it really depends. But so that's where you really have to feel confident that you're at least going to make the booth fee back and hopefully, obviously make somewhat of a profit. So something that I think is a really good option, at least in the US, there's a lot of open studios events and those tend to be way less in terms of the booth fee. And they're really nice, just neighborhood events. It's all local people. And it's really nice because it only happens once a year. And so when it happens, people are like, oh, open studios, I have to go. Whereas if you go to a marketplace that's like every week, the whole year, it feels sort of ordinary and people aren't as into it because it's not a one-time thing. So sometimes you can pull in more people that way as well. Now, here's a strange concept that's a little hard to wrap your head around, but once you've experienced it, it actually makes a lot of sense. There is such a thing as pricing your work, quote, too low in that it's so low that it actually sends the message to your audience that it's not very good quality. Deepti, can you dig into this a little bit more? Because it's a strange idea that actually does exist. Yeah, it's a weird phenomenon. I mean, I think you can kind of compare it to when you go to like a Michelin restaurant and you get like a piece of grass on a white table, like white tablecloth with a little like decoration and it costs you $30 and you think that you're eating something really gourmet and you're going to talk about it forever. 
it's all about like just the aura that sometimes things create. But if you got that same piece of grass and it was, you know, $1, you'd probably be like, what the heck is this? So it's all about just, you know, making people feel, but I'm the worst person to talk about this because I'm always pricing my things for too low or just giving things away for free. So Alex, can you explain this maybe and how you had this? Cause I'm like the queen of pricing my art too low. Yeah, well, as it turns out, I'm pretty good at pricing it low myself because I remember this lesson on selling art that when you're talking prices, unfortunately, you only know it when it's too late. If you name the price and the person instantly agrees to it, you shot way too low. <laughs> so if you say, oh, yeah, a piece this size, I'd sell it for 200 and they say, oh, great, then you could have probably gotten more out of that one. Um, and that's one where... Yeah, you just have to look at the experience and walk that fine line between overpricing your work and underpricing it. Because, yeah, I think it's really easy for people to understand. Don't overprice it. But, yeah, you want people to think that they're investing in something that you put time and energy and love into. It's very hard to price your art. And we do have a stream where Lauren and I talk about all the factors. So definitely watch that if you guys are wondering about it. But I understand the impulse to price lower because you think, oh, if it's less, it'll make people want to buy it more. But there's a certain point where if you just shoot up your prices, people go, whoa, this is really worth it. Because I remember there was one point I got so busy with Art Prof. And I still had my shop open and I thought, oh, I don't want to deal with this because I have all these other things going on. So I thought, OK, I know how I'll fix this. Let me just double all the prices. Nobody's going to buy anything. People still bought it. And I was like, why? Like <laughs> this print was two hundred dollars. Now it's four hundred and people are still buying it. And so you can experiment a little bit. I mean, I don't know that I would do as severe of a change as I did. But I think a lot of us are sometimes surprised when people are like, yep, yeah, I'll pay 200. And then you're like, what, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, and with pricing work, there's a really great, great comment by Eolin, sorry if I got your name wrong, that's talking about you have to cater to different price points. Like there was, when I had the show, there was one piece of work that was very popular. A lot of people liked it and asked about it and they felt it was fairly priced. They just couldn't afford it. And so if I had prints and things like that of the work available, because for sometimes you get, yeah, it was this painting and it was just a dumb joke of the devil eating a sandwich and it said kale satan. And so many people found it very funny and they loved it. And I could have made a killing off of selling $25 prints or stickers or t-shirts with it. And it's just the more you know kind of thing. You have to cater for some of the fans that want your art but can't afford what it's worth. I will also say, too, it depends on the venue. Like when I show at a white cube gallery, it's a different price point than when I'm tabling. Like if I'm tabling, I usually don't charge more than $100 because I just know stuff when I'm tabling people don't go there to buy a $3,000 painting. I mean, Deep D, what's sort of the range in pricing when you table? Is it like me where it's like $100 or less or what do you usually do? Yeah, definitely. It's it's very much $100 or less. And sometimes people will bring a few originals or they'll price it much higher, you know, of course. But really a lot of times for tabling, the traffic or the people who are there want to go around and buy, you know, one thing from multiple tables. Like they have money to split. They're not there to buy one piece of artwork, which they might, you know, if you're at a white cube gallery. So you want to keep in mind that people aren't coming there with a hundred dollars to spend just on you. A lot of times they want to spend a hundred dollars on four different people. Melanie is saying, have any of you sold work through TikTok or is that mostly just building brand awareness? I looked at TikTok for five minutes and then decided I did not have the headspace to do it. Alex, have you tried TikTok? I have not. Um, I just turned 30, so I have not. <laughs> but there's an artist friend of mine who does use TikTok to promote their brands. They use TikTok really effectively to illustrate like the process videos and the ink washes and things like oh. that. And then they provide links to their Instagram to sell it. Hmm. Did you have you used TikTok? No, I spend hours every day on TikTok because I think it's the funniest thing on the in the world right now. But um, I know that you can probably use it really well because there is such an algorithm and really like I've already noticed 
I've been on TikTok for maybe a month, but I've already noticed that my feed is very specific to me as a person. So I'm sure that you could probably find a really great audience by being hyper specific in your marketing. So um, I'd recommend it. And I'd love to, I'd love to see how artists promote themselves on TikTok. That's really cool. All right. So another reason why you might be struggling is it's possible that you haven't cast a wide enough net in terms of the format for your artwork. So this is what people were talking about earlier about merch. And we were talking to you guys about, you know, if Alex had had this as a print, that would have been an opportunity. But actually on Monday, Deep D, Lauren and I are going to be doing a stream that's just about how to sell your artwork as merch. So we will get deep into that. But Deep D, why is merch a good thing to consider? Well, merch is a lot of times cheaper than original, you know, pieces or prints. And also you can merch, you can put your name on it. And it's like other people are walking advertisement for you. You know, you can make mugs or stickers or I, I've found that stickers are amazing because I've sold so many stickers of my art and I'll just put my name on the bottom, similar to this one on the screen. And people will put them on their laptops or on their phone cases. And then, you know, you're on the subway texting and my sticker is right there with my name on it. And that's just a wonderful way to market yourself for not a lot of money on your end and not a lot of money on there. And, or temp tattoos. It's literally on someone else's body. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what about you? Have you done merch for your work? Soon. I've been looking at different places to get uh, some vinyl stickers made. Uh, yeah, because I love that idea. And it's really, I keep going back to that Kale Satan one because to this day, I painted that almost five years ago, and people still say they want t-shirts, prints, and stickers of that one. So it's, um, yeah, it's it hasn't been the best year to go actually physically into print shops. <laughs> so that's put a pause on that. But yeah, that is definitely the goal to explore that market. Also, I will, I will say... Oh, sorry. I was just saying like okay. between artists, like in the friend community, I have a lot of friends who buy my merch to give to their friends because they want to a, be like, mm. oh, this is my friend. But it's also in a low price point. So it's like they're really excited that it has like your name on it and they can be like, this is, you know, my friend who made this shirt or something. But they also make really good gifts because a lot of times they're a little bit more informal than like a print or or something, you know, a little bit more like high art. It's kind of like a fun thing to give a mom for Christmas or yeah. a best friend for a birthday. So it's kind of like a more functional and friendly, like business card almost like totally <laughs> exactly that I think you'd love, but also check out their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about this one. And I think this is probably one that is the most difficult for people out of all of the factors that we're talking about is that it's possible that you're not promoting your shop effectively. And this really is the deal breaker because if people don't know about your shop, they can't buy anything. So that's the issue is spreading that awareness that you exist. So Alex, why do you think so many people struggle with the promotion of their shop? I think a lot of it from me in talking with artists and in listening to myself, it's about that old anxiety of, is my work ready to sell? Uh, even after you make that decision for yourself, you can still debate whether or not your work is worth sharing. Um, and I think that's the one where once you start, you just have to quiet that feeling. Uh, yeah, Deep did you have that experience of once you for, first sold your work and then how to keep that momentum going with promoting it? It's hard. I do feel like I get like embarrassed sometimes when I promote myself. It just feels really like braggy. And I think that's something a lot of artists have. But I think you just have to realize that that's how you're going to get traffic and that's how you're going to make these sales, which you have to do to survive a lot of the times. But I think that there are so many different ways of promoting that's not just social media, you know, word of mouth, getting your friends to talk to people about you. Because sometimes I found that I am horrible at talking about myself, but my friends are really great at hyping me up. And I'm also really great at hyping my friends up. Um, so sometimes you want to like exchange and cross promote. Um, there's so many different ways to do it, but you do have to be really consistent in my opinion, because if you fall off, people are going to forget about you. And then when you come back, they're going to be like, huh? Oh, yeah, what? Um, <laughs> but Clara, do you have any tips for self-promotion? Well, I would definitely watch this stream, you guys, that I did with Jordan, self-promotion mistakes. And I, full confession, have done every single one of these mistakes 
that we list in the stream, it's so tricky to promote yourself without being overbearing or pushy. It, it's like, how do you get that really delicate balance? It's very, very difficult. Although I love this comment from Lunaire who says, merch is the coolest business card, especially postcards and stickers. I discovered so many cool artists with their merch cross promotion through postcards and platforms like Redbubble. I never even thought about it that way. Maybe I should make some stickers. I've never actually made stickers before. And here's another merch question from Emily. Do you recommend making your own merch or outsourcing to places like Redbubble? Deepti, what do you think? Because I know you've done both. Yeah, it, it kind of depends. Like I, I recommend if you're making like a tote bag or something, um, do you have the energy to hand paint every single one? Because sometimes people want that, but also it's a lot easier sometimes to paint one, sell it for cheaper, and then just mass produce. Um, and then you have to think about price point too. So I like to do both because I can sell at different price points. Obviously the hand painted ones are gonna be more, but they're a bit more of a novelty. And sometimes that sells better around the holidays because people have more money to spend. But just a regular tote bag for $15 that I can mass produce in Redbubble might sell pretty um, consistently, but it doesn't have the same kind of like artistic feel. So just think about who your audience is, maybe what they want and what works best for your price point where you're at right now. I mean, I'll tell you guys that I have never made my own merch because I feel like I don't have the patience for all the production. And so I love stuff like Redbubble where you can just get it printed on demand. It's just so convenient. So I would definitely check that out. Alex, have you ever made your own merch or do you mostly just do on demand? Uh, actually, yeah, any merch that I have made has been made myself. And that has been such a feat. It was, I was lucky enough in Denver to have found a really good print shop that unfortunately closed down um, a few years ago. But I would have events and I would print out prints of them that I would be able to be there in person and check the color, make sure the paper was the fine enough quality. Uh, so I have been very personally nervous about trusting an outside resource, which I've known from talking to other artists is something that I shouldn't worry too much about. Because, yeah, there will be a dip in quality, but it's not going to be bad enough. Melanie Reader is saying definitely having multiple price points in a good takeaway from what I'm hearing. Absolutely. I mean, I have stuff that I sell in a white cube gallery that's a few thousand dollars. But you can also buy a quick sketch for me that's something that's $50. And so I think that's important because if you only have all your paintings are $5,000, the likeliness that you're going to be selling on an ongoing basis really goes down. So having that variety is nice and also just making your work more accessible. Like Deep D, don't you think that is a nice thing to think, wow, this thing is not $5,000. Everybody can afford, well, not everybody, but a lot of people can afford a $5 pin, right? Definitely. And I mean, as someone who doesn't have $5,000 myself to spend on anything, but also wants to support artists, it is great to be able to, you know, see an artist you really like and, and find a way to support them and have a piece of their work. And also from the seller's perspective, you might notice that your things in the $50 price point are selling amazingly in comparison to the $5 price point or the $5,000 price point. So that might be something for you to like you know tap into and learn that that's the work that people are really responding to or that's a price point that people are really responding to so it's all things to consider and it's ways to build your brand and grow so in five years you know you might be making a lot more money because you've figured all this whole algorithm of how to sell your work <laughs> out Artprof has a podcast it's available on spotify and also on itunes in a few minutes, Deep D, Alex, and I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord. We will be in the post live streams channel. I know a lot of you guys had great comments and questions that we did not get to, so we would love to be able to address all that in the Discord. If you're not in the Discord, shame on you, because that's where all the cool kids hang out. And the invite link is in the video description below. If you guys would like to join, we would love that. Please subscribe to our channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you to our top Patreon supporters for giving us the support we need to keep Art Prof free and available to everybody. And thank you to everybody who watched the stream and contributed questions, made comments. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Bye.